to remind you, Eric and Isaac started out by uh, showing how we could um, apply UAV technology to their issue of access, the extreme environment in which they were operating. Uh, Jean-Yves uh, explained how you can use technology to drive a paradigm shift with regards to borehole regeneration. So instead of just uh, digging a new one, can we just repair the existing ones? And finally, uh, Manu and, and Ivan uh, both attack the same problem, that this issue of uh, shouting over the fence. How do we, how do we I mean, it's ridiculous. Uh, to, to, in this modern day and age, that's how we have to communicate information and provided a technical solution to that, which we then found that they could apply to lots of other applications as well. I think it's interesting to note that um, all of the problems were expressed by field clinicians originally. Uh, and so it was people from the field, people like Brett that you saw in the video that Mano showed, uh, who said, help, we've got this problem, we can't solve it at field level. Uh, and I think uh, uh, it's been, it's been uh, alluded to in your introduction, Arjen, but uh, innovation happens in the field all the time, every day, uh, and by everyone, and particularly the national staff, are a very innovative population. And if they can find a solution themselves, they're not going to call us. Uh, they're just going to get on with it. Um, and so these were examples where, where uh, they couldn't find a solution themselves, uh, and uh, they called us, and we did our best to respond and, and find a solution to uh, uh, to, uh, to respond to the problem with, with success, I think, in, uh, in all cases. The second point I'd like to make is that um, they all collaborated with external actors. I think, uh, Tarun, you mentioned, uh, I mean, many people have mentioned the importance of this collaboration with academia, with corporate, uh, and um, I think it's interesting to explore those relationships, uh, which, for example, uh, well, in, in, the, in the case of, of Manu, moved from a simple client service relationship where, where uh, we, we purchased technology, but now move to a kind of consultancy relationship where we, we have the tech with the competence in-house and they, they offer a consultancy support. And I think the same is actually uh, to be said across uh, all of you. And so, uh, so with that in mind, let's move on. Are there any questions? So there's one online. I'll take that straight away. Please go ahead. Um, so just to acknowledge our online audience who are busy tweeting comments, um, like, and I quote, um, following the last few talks, I'm singing, ain't no mountain high enough, ain't no valley low enough, ain't no river wide enough. Um, so thank you for your support. Um, I have two questions. So the first one is from the deputy editor of The Lancet, Infectious Diseases, who asks, with regards to the UAVs, what level of collaboration have you had or do you see having in the future with corporations currently using this technology, such which is Amazon. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you. I think, as Eric has already mentioned, we only started with Maternet because they, mm. they are also interested in this kind of uh, use of the UAVs. But since then, we have actually had uh, people saw uh, what we did uh, on the internet, and we have actually had people contacting us to say, hang on, we have this, we have this. So it's just uh, a matter of trolling through all these proposals that are coming up and we see what is uh, suitable to what we need in the field. It's, we are still some ways off, but uh, yeah, we will collaborate with uh, anybody who can come up with the, the, uh, what we need in the field. Mm. Okay. Second question. Um, the second question is from MSF Zimbabwe, who um, direct this question um, to the presenter of the boreholes. Um, very context-specific technology would indeed be much needed in Zimbabwe. Well done. Um, is there a plan in the future to train more Watson officers on how to use this innovation? So will you be training? Uh, are you, you're running a workshop? The, well, the, 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 the thing is, it's quite heavy to maintain alive this, uh, this workshop because we have a high turnover with expat. And we know that also when expat get the knowledge, very often uh, they leave MSF. Mm. So we have to start again and again. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's heavy for us to maintain it. So that's the internal discussion that we have for the moment. Do we keep it internal with as heavy as it is and we have to start always, always? Or do we uh, create an external uh, service provider like a uh, I would say uh, a technical interface that we could just call when we need and could be called by any uh, humanitarian organization, for example. Um, that's the, the, that's the, the discussion on, yeah, on the table at the moment. Okay, thank you. thank you very much. So there's a question I'll take first, the gentleman on the left with the orange jumper, and then afterwards, uh, Maya. Thank you for all the practical example you have given this afternoon. Once upon a time was a map of the world with terra incognita. Mm. This is where you are working today. Mm. 
you are working today on place when there is no legislation or no applied legislation on personal data management of the patient. Do you agree? Don't you agree? But if you try to put the information on cloud in Lebanon or in Myanmar, it will not work like that. So don't you think we are just occupying, in the name of emergency, in the name of technology, a place where laws are not yet implemented or developed, and that could be further a contradiction with what we do on patient's file. I don't speak about mm. an X or a Y. I speak about n even names we've seen on Lotus Notes program. I hope that the names were not existing stuff mm. from Afghanistan. Mm. You see, all these issue of personal data, how do you see it in the future? Because for me, it, it, yeah, there is an issue of law and order. Mm. In ICSC, we have this problem. We work on place of detention. We have personal data, place of detention. We have to use totally secured data. Mm. And you know very well that once in a while at the White House, there's somebody who is doing a paper, data. Guantanamo paper on the floor that is left behind. All this issue of having related data, not only on medical, but on protection issue, because all of us work in protection. How do you see that in the future? Mm. Thank you very much. I think it's a very good question. It touches on something that's been raised earlier by our colleague uh, at the back. Uh, and, and I think it touches on the, the, in the keynote speech as well, Some, a question that was raised. Uh, where are we going with this? This is a bulldozer. Um, watch out. Uh, does anybody feel the, like offering a <laughs> reply? <laughs> Sure. <laughs> All right. Um, first off, um, it's it's clear that we store personally identifiable information of patients in the NIS or in the NIH in, in the health system here in, in Europe. So clearly, there's some kind of standard that people can apply, even where there is strong legislation and strong public opinion, and where people have a strong enough voice to defend their privacy. Mm -hmm. So we actually look at those uh, at those standards. Um, in emergencies, sure, it's clear that the paper system that we were using is less confidential than, than we would expect in a normal health facility, starting with shouting over the fence, which, by the way, I would say is considerably less secure than, than, <laughs> than transmitting it over the Wi-Fi. Much more, uh, quite a number more people can understand what you're saying when you're shouting over the fence than can hack into your Wi-Fi. Um, that can be done as well. To some extent, there's a question of actually living in the real world and not saying, well, we have to put you know, 48-bit encryption or 128-bit encryption in every transmission of the Wi-Fi within the Ebola Center and go, who are the potential people that might want to listen in? What are the risks? And judge it. I mean, if you're talking about information of people in detention centers or HIV-positive people in Uganda, that's a completely different thing than an emergency malaria setting or, or, or an Ebola setting. So one has to live in the world and, and do some risk-benefit judgments. Mm -hmm. You can't hamstring yourself and, and be unable to do a response to help people. Sometimes you know, the, the right to treatment has to be balanced with the right to privacy, mm -hmm. which is not to say that we throw the baby out with the bathwater and go, well, Africans don't need privacy anyway. No, not at all. Uh, we, for example, do not store stuff on the cloud with our application. It's all on a local server, and that local server is passworded. And, there's probably one or two people in this room who, given sufficient time and motivation, could get that information, mm -hmm. but not nearly so easily as they could by simply strolling in and grabbing the patient file, which is available to anybody who gets into the low-risk zone. Mm -hmm. So there's a question of progress, and there's a question of proportionality, and there's a question of judgment. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, in Myanmar or Lebanon, <laughs> where there's also the question of security and access, mm -hmm. we have to judge it as well. So my answer is, this is something that every agency and every project has to devote some thought space to. Yeah, I think uh, there's another slightly obvious thing. I mean, apart from Dr. Isaac, uh, who is a medical and has this ingrained in his blood, uh, this patient protection idea, we are, to a large extent, non-medical people, so we have to learn this, uh, and we have to learn about ethics, uh, medical ethics specifically. Uh, and I think that's a, that's a learning process, and we're discovering today uh, that um, even... Uh, not blacking out people's names on presentations is an issue, and, uh, and I think you're very right to bring it up. 
Uh, and so that's, that's something that we need to address as a, as a community of, of medics working with non-medics to uh, avoid going the wrong way. So we move to Maya. Yeah, sorry, I'm going to change the subject. Well, first of all, to Jean, why don't you train a national staff up if there's a big expat turnover? And for the drones issue, um, what is the... Pers I mean, we talk about innovation and scaling up, and we're in Papua New Guinea for now. But what my question is, is what is the perception and about the neutrality and perception of MSF using drones, uh, the blurring of the lines versus military and... and and humanitarian organizations, and, and how are we going to deal with this? Okay, that, thanks very much. So first to, uh, to Jean-Yves, uh, the first question was the question on, uh, did you train the national staff on the use of this technology? And why, I mean, w would you consider a handover to the national staff to further use the kit that you've, uh, you've developed? And what are the issues or, or challenges around that? So in Niger, we have uh, this uh, workshop working for now for uh, two, more than two years uh, field activities. So we have one expatriate, and uh, the, the rest of the team are national uh, staff. So they are well trained how to use, how to uh, handle all the tools, and how to transform uh, into uh, Excel graph. But then after, the, the issue is how do you interpret it? So it's also a profession to be a hydrogeologist. So that takes time and years, and I'm sure that in Niger and everywhere, you find nice people that will be, uh, after years, well-trained and uh, independent. So we, we do that, yes. Hmm. We try. Okay, thanks very much. And did you address the question of drones? And, uh, well, well, the word, I've said it now. I shouldn't say the word drone. I should say unmanned aerial vehicle. Even that <laughs> itself is touchy. Uh, perhaps you could explore, unpack this issue, please, uh, Eric. So, yeah, technically, it's, uh, we're speaking about different technologies and, for sure, different perception. Uh, the UAVs we are using, because UAVs is, in fact, the commercial name for this kind of technology, and drones are the military name. Mm. Uh, the difference is, first of all, that we, uh, it's the communication we are passing through the, uh, through the authorities and uh, through, the, uh, through the local communities. We inform them, we are very clear with them, and we show them why we use it and for which purpose, and they can see it. So, uh, so it's a different level of perception. Uh, after, as you were raising, it's uh, to, if we want to see between the military and humanitarian world using this kind of technology, uh, it's more or less the same question I was speaking about the confidentiality of patient file. Mm -hmm. We have to think twice of where we want to deploy them. Mm -hmm. If uh, you want to use the same technology tomorrow in Afghanistan, your chance of success are very close to zero. Based first by the military, we'll shoot it down, and the local population will shoot it down. <laughs> so at, at the end of the day, it's really to think, and that's one of the constraints of this deployment of this kind of technology, is where we are able to use it. And also, it's clearly on the time of how we explain to the people why we are using that and how we are, how we are going to use it. So it's, it's not the same thing. And us, we are, I should say, the difference is that it's much smaller. It's obviously totally not dangerous. And, uh, and it's not at all the same kind of technology. Military one is much more an easier technology. So it's, uh, it's really completely different, uh, different system that we, are, that we are using. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to add a comment on the rebranding. I think there is a lot of work that needs to go into the rebranding of uh, drones because they, they came to us through the military and we're just uh, adapting the technology to what we do. So we need to work o on the naming of the, the drones as well. Already we've shifted to UAVs, but probably we need to move a little bit, uh, you know, like for hours we could call it uh, Sput Sputnik or something like that. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's, it's just that we, yeah, we, we need to think about this uh, 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 because people associate them with, uh, with the military, that's for sure. The one that we used uh, to film uh, Elwa 3, uh, Monrovia, uh, was, was in fact called an EB. Uh, and so maybe uh, there's another suggestion. Uh, and so but this comes up. But it's not the first time, and it certainly won't be the last, we've taken technology from the military. Um, the modular field hospital is a classic example. Uh, and we just ordered it in white instead of green. But it's the same thing. Uh, and so, but it, it <laughs> OK, we did a bit more than that. Uh, but simplifying things somewhat, three or four years of development. But, but uh, you, you get the point. So I think that the, the technology is out there and the perceptions need to be considered. The ethics need to be considered. So thank you once again for raising this very important point. Uh, and, uh, but the solutions are there. Uh, and so let's, let's apply them. Uh, and let's, uh, let's find solutions for our clinicians who, who are in need. 
So time for a, a couple more questions. Uh, I'll go firstly for the uh, gentleman in the front in the blue shirt. Uh, and secondly, uh, there was a hand raised, uh, yep, Lika in the middle. Uh, and finally, uh, at the back, uh, black shirt. So first, please introduce yourself. Hi, TJ Campbell, MSF UK. Um, great presentations all. I was uh, specifically interested in, in um, asking about the relative numbers of people who used uh, the tablet versus the PDA mm -hmm. in, in the Ebola uh, treatment areas. And as part of the evaluation of, of what worked and what needs to be improved, who, how to, if you could give some insight in, in who looks at the, the outcome of these two uh, technology units and, and maybe suggest best practices across MSF and other organizations, like how that works and what happens next, like who, who looks at that? Good. So it's a very good question. Uh, I think uh, a, a short answer, if you uh, will. Manu, uh, I'll feed the board first. Well, I, I can say that the, we, uh, we had uh, 80 patients registered in the system and um, <coughs> well, during the pilot, which was around uh, three months. And um, well, uh, the uses were basically the, the, the clinicians uh, going inside. Uh, and that we also got a really good feedback from them about the, the user friendliness of, uh, of, the, of the tool. So. Um, and uh, well, for, for the future, I think uh, what I was, I, what I thought I was missing in this project is uh, to be uh, uh, in, on the ground for, uh, for more time uh, or checking uh, that everything is going well. Like I said, you know, we need these skilled people. We need uh, a project, manage, project management to, uh, to make sure people continue to, uh, to use it, that they understand how to use it. It's very easy to use, but they need to be, uh, they need a little encouragement anyway, so. Mm. Okay, and to, to address the question, Ivan, of a, a now what next? We've produced these solutions. Where do we scale up? How do we scale up? Who decides where to scale what? Do we choose? Do we not choose? How do, how do we deal with that? I propose that in order to choose which system we adopt, uh, that uh, Manuel and I should uh, have a wrestling match. Okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so we'll arrange that in the pub later on this evening. So for those of you who want to join us. Uh, <laughs> No, I, I think actually it's not time to choose yet. I think right. there, there are tremendous advantages of each approach, and I would even say there are advantages to the approach that MSF Switzerland took with the scan pen. Uh, it's not time to throw out any of these, uh, these innovations that we've worked on. Um, I'm certainly interested in going in the direction of, of other pathologies. I think our system is probably somewhat more adapted to more complex situations where you, where you might have conditional uh, questions, for example, questions that'll come up only if you do a certain thing, and we have a little more sort of text entry capacity. Whereas I would say if you're looking at something like a cholera, a simpler and more emergency type disease, I, I personally, even working for, uh, for MSF UK and having developed this, I would be taking a very, very close look at uh, at Manuel's system. Mm. So what to do from here? Well, my answer there is let's see what the field needs. Voila. Uh, listen to the clinicians. Thanks very much. And so we move to uh, the question. Uh, Lika, could you uh, reintroduce yourself? Me? Yeah, so my name is Lika from uh, OC Bay. I gave her earlier a presentation about the learning and development system in Afghanistan. And I just, I don't have a question, I just want to give a quick remark over the, about the first question I heard about the privacy of the data. Mm -hmm. Just to reassure you, what I showed you was a copy of the online tool, and we reshuffled all the data. So what you saw was not the real names of the staff and not the real names of the projects. <laughs> Plus the spots were protected, so rest assured that this was really privacy uh, protected the information that we showed you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lika, for, for clearing that out for yourself. Uh, okay, Doug. Hi, uh, Estrella Lazare, MSF. Uh, I have a question. It, it's not really a question, but it kind of answers to what you were saying now. Why do you have to choose? Why, why not work yeah. together? I, I see both systems, that the systems that you both presented, and I've seen both of them, one in the field and one outside of the field. One is would be very adaptable for a hospital setting, and the other one for an outreach setting. But they need to speak to be able to speak for to each other. Mm. Is that possible, or is the competition so high that that's just never going to happen? <laughs> okay, so, so it is possible. It is possible. <laughs> <laughs> no competition. <laughs> it is possible, and whatever competition there is is very friendly. Mm. No, it's, uh, uh, there, there are technical challenges with making different systems uh, speak to one another, but one of the things that we've invested a lot in, uh, in both sides is, uh, is databases, to have the data stored in, in you know, professionally set up databases. And once you have that, then 
a good part of that work is done. Um, but I certainly think that all of these kinds of initiatives should be as modular as possible so that if you don't like my tablet, fine, use the PDA, but my server might still be interesting mm. for you. So there, there's bits of the... Oh, definitely, yeah. Mm. yeah. Manu? No, I agree with you. Um, well, for the for the geeks out there, uh, the, the, the database in OpenMRS and the one we used uh, in our project is also is my MySQL. So they are the kind of the same, and it would be actually very easy to to migrate uh, data from one to another, uh, or even even I could even envision at some point to uh, to move uh, uh, Elios uh, as it is today to uh, an OpenMRS uh, data model. So all of this is. Uh, is possible uh, and it doesn't require uh, that much effort. Eh? The, um, I think the main reason uh, when I started the project, I also thought about OpenMRS, but I found it a bit um, too uh, too much complicated for what we wanted to achieve. So I went for a simpler solution, which was going to be also I, th I thought uh, faster. So because it was an emergency, we wanted to be there as soon as possible to help uh, our clinicians in the in the World Three. And he was right; he was faster. So that was a good choice. <laughs> So you see, you begin to feel the healthy tension between uh, the other. Healthy <laughs> tension. <laughs> uh, we, 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 uh, we did slightly different things, both of which have yes. uh, different values. But we're talking. I agree totally. I mean, it's uh, <laughs> complementary solutions. And uh, we're going to go to the pub afterwards and talk more. <laughs> So on that note, uh, on that note of, of collaboration, uh, I'd like to thank uh, the presenters today and award them with the, the flip-flop of innovation. Uh, uh, and, uh, to remind you uh, never to wear flip-flops in the field uh, and to, to, to encourage you to continue innovating. Thank you very much. Please, please keep to your chairs. So thank you very much for this uh, presentation. I think it throws up you know, exciting new opportunities, but also uh, some, some questions related to those new opportunities. Um, so uh, uh, thank you very much for highlighting the possibilities as well as uh, some of the questions that we will face uh, uh, in, in the future as MSF and as other humanitarian organizations. And thank you very much, Robin, for um, uh, presenting in the enthusiastic manner that you did. And um, uh, 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 you will get a, a chair afterwards. But, well, in the pub. Um, uh, what I wanted to do is basically, before I hand over to, to Kieran, Dr. Kieran, who, who's going to uh, uh, give some, uh, so, uh, some thoughts on the day, um, I, I just wanted to make sure that I thank everyone who has been involved in this day. Um, uh, and in particular, and uh, I'm looking at my notes because I don't want to forget anyone, you know, we've had uh, a, a fantastic speakers. We've had um, uh, the chairs who have been also equally fantastic. We have had delegates. We have the online audience who has been, um, and Kieran will tell a little bit more about the, uh, the number and where they came from. Uh, uh, the Royal Society of Medicine, the digital and logistics teams, of course, the organizers and uh, the editorial committee that has selected uh, all the presentations and which was drawn from across the MSF movement. And then, in particular, um, I wanted to thank uh, the people on the field who have, uh, you know, very often uh, been at heart and at the beginning of, uh, of, of the innovations and of the, uh, the, the changes that we're seeing and uh, that we were seeing presented today. And, uh, you know, a massive cheer and applause for the volunteers who have been, been here all day and who have been helpful and uh, who have made this day um, a success. Uh, so a big cheer for all of those. Oh. Hey. This day has also been sponsored. Um, uh, I don't think corporate sponsored, but nonetheless, we have had sponsored. We have the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, uh, the Royal Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene, Biomed Central, PLOS Medicine, Lancet, the Global Health, um, F1000, and the Welcome Trust, and they have been all uh, been very generous in uh, their support towards making this day a possibility.